and she wrote to me and told me that when she lived here in the 1890s with her mother, she, her mother frequently met the ghost of Nell Gwynne. Now, although the monks, of course, have been gone for over 400 years, you can very much still feel the sense of them here. And I heard what was quite definitely chanting. It was coming in uneven waves off the hill opposite the house, but she's fading, slightly fading, and I don't think she'll be coming to this house much longer now. They were talking about ghosts, ghosts they've seen or heard or felt. This was not idle talk. These people truly believe in their ghosts. Most of the people you've just seen, some of them titled, live in England's stately houses. Their normal surroundings are mansions and castles going back 500 years or even more. The house behind me, Salisbury Hall, is historic and haunted. Roman soldiers once kept their watch here, and ever since, great and near-great people have lived and died here, so naturally it shelters ghosts. Ghosts inhabit four out of five of England's historic houses. You do not find mention of these ghosts in the guidebooks. It might be bad for business. The business of attracting tourists to stately houses at half a crown a head. Let us then invite you behind the facade the tourist sees and tell you of strange tales, some frightening, some beautiful, all remote from today. For our research and to tell our stories, we chose three experts. Every theater-goer knows and loves that most English of actresses, Margaret Rutherford. Few know that she happens also to be a true believer in ghosts. So too is Tom Corbett, one of London's best-known society clairvoyants. With them, we present her husband, Stringer Davis. This is their story of what they found as they tell it. mile we were traveling deeper and deeper into the west country. As we passed Stonehenge, that enigma built by an unknown people in the dark time before history began, I remember Mr. Corbett turned to me and said, you know there's an affinity between Stonehenge and Longleat. How true that is. In its vastness, its gray strangeness, Stonehenge set the key for the house we were about to visit, the Wiltshire home of the Marquis of Bar, Longleat. Today, Longleat is a magnificent relic paid homage to every year by thousands of tourists. It was built to be a family home, but now only a few of its hundred rooms are occupied by Lord Bath's eldest son. The gardens are meticulously cared for, but no one plays croquet anymore. There is no bustle in the servants' hall. The beautiful furniture has a frozen, unused look. The great Longleat collection of books, one of the finest private collections in the world, today stands immobile and unread upon the shelves. Up in the nursery, there are marks on the wall to show where generations of children have stood to have their height measured. But there are no children now. In 1735, something happened at Longleat which brought horror to the house. An atmosphere which has never left it, which has touched each generation, charging the air with an unhappy restlessness. Lord Bath told us the story at dinner over port. Now what I want to tell you is the legend of Longleat. I don't say it's gospel, mind you, but there have been some, how shall I put it, uncanny happenings which prove it as near as damn it. 
It all began in about 1733 when my great, 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 great grandfather, the second Viscount, married and brought back to Longleat the beautiful and lovely Lady Louisa Cartridge as his wife. Her beauty and her charm and wit had been the rage of London, and society was absolutely thunderstruck when she married my ancestor, who, I have to admit, wasn't much of a chap. The marriage wasn't successful. It was at one of those many balls held at Longleat at the time. Louisa met and fell in love with a young man. We don't really know who he was. We only know that he returned her love and that it was a very tempestuous affair. One night, Weymouth happened to discover them together and challenged his rival to a duel, being careful first to lock his wife inside her bedroom. The duel ended in tragedy. The lover was killed. Louisa Carteret died soon afterwards of a broken heart, they say. And as if he were a guilty man, Viscount Weymouth shut up Longleat and went to spend what was left of his life in the nearby village of Horningsham, leaving behind him an empty house. But was it empty? Ever since then, the corridor where the duel took place has been filled with a restless, unhappy atmosphere. Down the ages, people have told stories about it. They tell of a green figure that wanders along it, of the sound of weeping. Gradually, it has become accepted that the spirit of Louisa Carteret has bound itself to that corridor, searching always searching for her dead lover. Well, that's the legend as far as it goes. But we do know that the Viscount left Longleat his home never to return. And during recent years, we have made an uncanny discovery, uh, which I'll show you later on. Now, I've never actually myself seen or heard the supernatural. But I can remember in my lifetime Servants walking, oh, miles round the passages, rather than to go down that corridor at night. And in any case, I can promise Mr. Corbett sufficient work for any medium here at Longleat tonight. Oh, Mr. Corbett isn't a medium. He's a clairvoyant. Mediums claim to be in touch with the spirit world through a guide, a long-dead man or woman whose job it is to bridge the gulf between the living and the dead. But clairvoyants make no such claim. I just happen to be born with a gift. I can see ghosts. I can't exercise nor tell them to go away, but when they're around, I can see them. Well, if that's the case, we might as well get on with the job. Uh, but before we go to the haunted corridor, I would like to introduce you to my librarian, Miss Coates, who says she's actually seen the ghost. Oh, yes, please do. Well, it was not so much a matter of seeing with one's physical eyes as of feeling something very sinister in a particular spot in that corridor. It happened during my first week at Longleat when I was trying to find my way from the Red Library up to my bedroom. Instead of arriving there, I came to a corridor on the top floor where I'd never been before. As I was walking along, there was a turn in the corridor and I made it to go around it and was immediately enveloped, one might almost say, with an atmosphere that was so terrifying that I couldn't go on. I 
pulled myself together after a second or so and tried to move on. But the atmosphere got stronger. It was full of hatred and violence. And something worse than that, something really evil. It literally paralyzed me for a few moments. We are going there now, Miss Coates. Would you care to join us? No, thank you. I, I never go there now. The ghost is known as the Green Lady, but I always think that to be somewhat of an embellishment, prompted really by the fact that Lady Louisa had a portrait painted in a green dress. And in any case, as a matter of fact, the people who've seen the ghost testified to it being greyish in colour. Well, ghosts rarely manifest themselves in colour, Lord Bath. They're usually described as grey or whitish grey because that's the general colour of the ectoplasm which surrounds psychic manifestation. Might we go round that corner? Thank you. is indeed a sad part of the house. Yes, I think it is. And this is the scene of the great tragedy. I don't know why it's the, sad then. Where the, the Viscount Weymouth yeah. slain his wife's lover. Can't you feel it yourself? Yes. The unpleasant and, and, and rather hair-raising atmosphere of this corridor. Perhaps we can bring a little cheer from I our own we lives. Can. See here, by those two pictures, we have the ghost of the man who was murdered. He comes back here. You wouldn't think he'd want to come back, would you? Well, uh, one can only assume if uh, uh, that he's coming back to meet his Loved one. Yes, that's... When that he was, was separated undying from her. and nothing could alter it. That, of course, was it, wasn't it? Well, he was separated from her in this life. Yes, yes. So I suppose it is natural yes. that he would want to find her in the next. Yes. Well, I hope he did. The slowly fading. Mm -hmm. It's very dear of her to come, isn't it, and see us. It occurs to me, Tom... Uh, would it be possible to record such a materialization as we have just seen uh, by means of um, camera lens? Yes, but never in color. However, there will be many pictures of ectoplasmic manifestations recorded in black and white film. There's the famous photograph taken at the island Nielsen Seance, during which time the spirit of Queen Astor the Belgians made her appearance. And this is she was in real life. The famous picture of the ghost at Raynham Hall, the home of the Marquis of Townsend. And here is a series of photographs taken of the American medium Ethel Post and the gradual materializations. Well then, do you think uh, one could venture to use such a, an experiment here, in this case? Well, I sincerely hope somebody will try it. Yes, that would be good. Tom Corbett asked Alan Fabian to come down from London and set up his special time-lapse camera equipment all night in the haunted corridor at Longleat to see if we could catch the image of Louisa Carter's on the film. We were not to know the results of that experiment until much later. 
As we left the haunted corridor to go down to the cellars, where Lord Bath had promised us we would find proof that the legend was true, we passed once again through the beautiful Bishop Ken Library. By the way, this is only part of the collection of the books at Longleat. We have over 30,000 volumes divided between this library up here and two more on the ground floor. William Shakespeare, the first folios. This legend is true. In 1911, my father decided to modernize what was even then considered to be a somewhat antiquated form of central heating. But in order to do so, he had to lower the floor of the existing furnace room, which is just up here ahead. When they lifted those flagstones, that they found the skeleton of a man. Uh, most of the clothing that he was wearing had completely deteriorated into dust, with the exception of a pair of boots, which were identified as belonging to the time when Louisa Cartridge came to Longleat. So this is where they buried Louisa's lover. The following day, we saw the film that had been taken in the haunted corridor. There was something on it. You see it now? Yes. Coming down the Comes wall. Comes through the door. Quite right. Through the door on the it left. It seems to go disappear at that door on the left. You see? Yes. Well, do you think that that uh, has a, a significance? Well, frankly, I would have thought it was the beginning of a manifestation. Let me run it back for you again. Yes, please. Well, let's go back on that again. Mm. There's no suggestion that it was a car light, which, of course, does spring to one's mind that a light from a car would travel. Yes, but you can't because it's in the well at the yeah. back mm -hmm. and it's surrounded by four very high walls, so that's yeah. an impossibility. Yeah. And, of course, we have the testimony of Jeff Smith, the electrician, who spent the whole night there. Yes. Yeah. Well, we sat there this night with this stop frame camera, Alan Fabian and myself. Um, all the lighting conditions were controlled. The windows were blacked out. There was no possibility of moonlight or car headlights or anything coming through. Um, when we saw the stuff later, there was this shaft of light, which is, to me is completely unexplainable. Of course, we can never know conclusively, but I prefer to believe that it was a sign from Lady Carteret, thanking us for our interest and wanting us to know that all was well with her. By the time we left Longleat, it was dark. The swans on the ornamental lake stood out like porcelain figurine on the black water. 
There is a legend that when the swans fly away from Longleat, never to return, the thin family will die out. It is fervently to be hoped that day will never arrive. We are in the Crown Chamber of Salisbury Hall, the home of Mr. and Mrs. Walter Goldsmith. We are waiting for a ghost to appear. The ghost of Nell Gwynne. Salisbury Hall is one of the smallest of the stately homes of England. Its approach is by an undistinguished looking farm track leading off the main London road four miles south of St Albans. A sudden switch to the left and you are facing a small bridge over a moat. Cross that bridge and you are on a few square yards of earth whose history is the history of England. For ever since men knew how to build, there has been a house at Salisbury Hall. Beneath this floor is hard-beaten earth, which knew the heavy imprint of a Roman soldier's sandal. But for the legend of Salisbury Hall, and the hauntings. We have only to go back three centuries to those magnificent days of Charles II, that charming, sensual, merry monarch of the Restoration. In 1668, Samuel Pepys wrote in his diary, the king did send for Nell Gwynne. She was 18, a red-headed, impish, witty, loyal gutter snipe who had made her way up from the streets to be an orange seller, to be eventually the best-loved actress and comedian of her day. He was a splendid man in his early 40s. Neither were exactly new to love. The king's mistresses were notorious and legion, and Nellie, well, Nellie came from the poorest streets of London, where life was lived to its fullest, and pleasure taken when and where one might. The liaison that began that day, in 1668, was to last until their death. It was here that he brought her away from the prying eyes and gossiping tongues of the court. In that room upstairs, their first son was born and the king created him Duke of St. Albans. Because from this bedroom window can be seen in the distance the ancient city of St. Albans. Nellie was only 35 when the king died. She outlived him by just two years. 
every hour of them in danger of being thrown into a debtor's prison. Her death was in the utmost poverty. Gather ye rosebuds while ye may. Old time is still a flying. And this same flower that smiles today, tomorrow will be dying. Yes, this is Nellie's house where she loved and laughed and to which she now returns. She now returns. She now returns. Have you ever seen a Nell Gwynn, Mr. Goldsmith? No, I regret very much I haven't actually seen Nell Gwynn. But there's a great deal of compelling evidence to show that she does, in fact, reappear. That book, by your left hand, Mr. Davis, contains the testimony of no less a person than Sir Winston Churchill's stepfather, who once lived in this house. It's called Edwardian Heydays. Ah, here's the passage. One evening at Salisbury Hall, just as it was getting dusk, I came down the staircase, which leads into the old panelled room that we used as a dining room, and there, standing in a corner, I saw the figure of a youngish and beautiful woman with a blue fichu round her shoulders. She looked intently at me, then turned and disappeared through a door in the passage. I followed her and found nothing. She looked so exactly like a former nursemaid of ours called Ellen Bryan that I felt certain she must have died and I had witnessed an apparition of her at the moment of her death. I thought no more about the matter until a few weeks later when my sister Daisy came to visit us. As Salisbury Hall had been inhabited by Nell Gwynne, I had a hobby of collecting prints of this lady and taking up one, Daisy said, I never realized before the truth of what people used to say about Ellen Bryan, how she was exactly like the pictures of Nell Gwynne. She is here. She is very definitely here. Is she here? I mean, is she in our midst? Oh, yes, without a doubt. But she's fading. I don't think she'll come to this house much longer. Because she appears to me as though she's finally reaching her state of rest. Pity it isn't happening to the one upstairs, Tom. You know, we've got two ghosts at Salisbury Hall. You have got a ghost of a man here. He passed out of this life, I would say, through rather tragic circumstances. We know all about this one. I'd better give you a bit of the background history first. During the Civil War, this was a royalist stronghold, and the whole house was honeycombed with secret hiding places for hiding arms. And during some engagement in the district, some cavalier fled here and hid in one of these numerous hiding places and he was awfully afraid he was going to give away secrets, so he committed suicide. Now, Mrs. Goldsmith has had distinct manifestations of this person. Yes, it happened to me in that bedroom through there. One night when I had a rather heavy cold and I went to sleep in that room, I was awakened at about one o'clock in the morning, I suppose, by the sound of footsteps passing the door in the corridor outside. I switched on my bed lamp and I expected him to come and see how I was. But the footsteps never returned. In the morning I asked Walter about this and he said that throughout the whole night he'd never stirred. And I've had the same experience several times since then. And to prove that it's not simply my imagination playing tricks on me, I'd like to read you a bit of a letter which I had from Mrs. Rose Stutzel, 
who spent her childhood in this house. One ghost often felt by the children was in the bedroom over the entrance hall with the porch dressing room. This was my parents' room and a child used to sleep at the foot of the bed. Both my brother and my sister were wakened by something terrifying standing by the bed and this on many occasions. In the same room my governess spent a night while my mother was away on business. She said something terrifying came through the door and stood by her bed. Another friend had the same experience. This seems the most convincing evidence of an unseen visitor. Indeed it does. Let me ask you a question, Mrs. Goldsmith. He wants us to follow him. Surely there must have been another wing to this house. Yes, it was burnt down in 1813. But this is where the ghost walks. So you see, Mrs. Goldsmith, you may well have been right about the footsteps that went in one direction only. But you're wrong in thinking, Mr. Goldsmith, that you have just two ghosts. On the way in, I found a third one on the bridge leading to the house. More than two. One thing I will say about these grounds, you can hardly dig a spade into the earth without coming up with some archaeological treasure. I found a complete history of artifacts, Roman coins, 15th century spurs. The only thing I haven't discovered is the entrance to the old cellar. This is another of the ghosts of Salisbury Hall. The prototype of the gallant little mosquito fighter bomber which started its life here when the hall became a workshop for Sir Geoffrey de Havilland. Yes, there's no doubt at all but you have the ghost of a woman here. I would have said that she's extremely pleasant and, and uh, if you can describe the word warm-hearted ghost, I'm sure that in life she was. As Tom identified still another ghost, I turned for a last look at this historic and haunted house. My feelings were mixed, as they must ever be when seeking to converse with the world of the spirit. Salisbury Hall had seemed to me aglow with the past. One had felt the presence of Nell Gwynne. I resented the thought that her generous and courageous spirit should ever be in any way earthbound. Perhaps though she had been seeking again the happiness that was hers for a short while in this house. They say her image is fading. May we believe, as Tom does, that she is finding her rest and fulfillment in that other life that we hope awaits us all. With joy we leave thee, false world, and do forgive all thy false treachery, for now we'll happy live, that thus we happy live. In 1204, the days of Robin Hood, when King John ruled England, 30 monks and their abbot came to this place, this beautiful place called Bewley. To this remote stretch of land on England's south coast to build an abbey. They were Cistercians, one of the strictest orders in the Roman Catholic Church. In obedience to their rule, the abbey was to be of the simplest architecture, far away from the habitation of ordinary folk, to possess no gold nor silver ornamentation. Even the crucifix was to be made of plain wood. Working with their bare hands, 
It took them 42 years to complete the abbey. But when they had completed it, it looked something like this. They worked hard and they prayed hard. But above all, the monks of Beaulieu sang. The Cistercians' special care was for the dead. At the hour of two every morning, the monks rose from their beds and each carrying a candle would make their way from the dormitory to the abbey for vigils and the commemoration of the dead. Gradually, the column of cowled figures, lit by flickering flames, wound its way chanting into the abbey and each monk took his allotted place. When there was a death at the abbey, the voices of the monks rose louder than ever. As they carried the body to its grave, interceding with God for the soul of their dead brother. Gradually, the monks of this and other abbeys began to lose their simplicity of life. In 1536, the worldliness of the monasteries gave Henry VIII his excuse to dissolve them and to appropriate to himself their wealth and lands. Bewley was taken from the monks and sold to Sir Thomas Ryersley, Earl of Southampton, an ancestor of the present owner, Baron Montague of Bewley. So for over 400 years there have been no monks at Bewley. But is this really so? For there are those who say that the souls of the monks who worked and worshipped in the sanctuary have returned there after death. Today you will find many people at Bury who say that the voices of the monks have never been stilled and that cowled figures still walk the old paths and lanes of the abbey. There are those too who have seen a monk in brown wandering about, performing his duties as he did 400 years ago. And they say that if there has been a death on the estate or in the village, the chanting of voices can be heard in the still of the night louder and clearer than ever. We were eager to present ourselves at Beulah. Too many people have seen ghosts of the monks of Beulah Abbey too many times to permit doubt in any but the most skeptical mind. I must admit that although I haven't actually seen a ghost myself, I know a great many people have. Now this house, for instance, was the great gatehouse of the Abbey of Bewley and has been part of the family home since the 1500s. Now although the monks, of course, have been gone for over 400 years, you can very much still feel the sense of them here. For instance, people come up on the stairs here and often smell incense. And I remember as a child, my sisters too, uh, we were terrified of the landing here and used to rush by on our way to bed. Tell me, Lord Montague, do these ghostly phenomena remain generally consistent? Rigidly consistent. First of all, there is the visual haunting, uh, generally taking the form of a monk in brown being seen on various parts of the estate. And then there are the auditory hauntings, which take the form of chanting of monks, heard usually at night. Now I want you to come and meet my sister, because when it comes to ghosts, she's had some of the weirdest experiences of all. Really? Is she at home today? I was 18 at the time. I was sitting at this window, looking out into the grounds, probably mooning over some boy or other I thought I was in love with. Gradually I became aware there was a choir singing outside. 
there's sound sort of rising and falling, rather like a primitive radio. Oh, yes. Suddenly I realized, though, that it was chanting I was hearing. Oh, fair. <laughs> a chill went up and down my spine, and when my dog started to howl, then I was really frightened. <laughs> Next day, I went to visit a friend of mine, Miss Amy Cheshire, who lived in the Abbey and whom I knew was very knowledgeable about psychic things and was in tune with the ghostly monks. While she was putting on the kettle for tea, I went over to her piano and I started to pick out the tune I'd heard the night before. It went something like this. <laughs> Round, she stared at me. She said, So you heard it too? They were very loud last night, weren't they? <laughs> yeah. Soon after, the Miss Cheshire died. Another lady took over her room. She was looking out of her upstairs window, which faced onto the ruined cloisters, when she saw a monk in a brown habit standing motionless in one of the arches. Out there. <laughs> One of the monks which we showed to the visitors here at Bewley, the robes came from the Abbot of Sito, the mother church of the order. My father obtained it from them some years ago. Oh, but why is he not wearing brown? Well, the brown robes were used by the lay brothers who worked yeah. at Bewley, but this is the black and white robes of the actual church monks. Oh. When I was a boy, there was a wonderful old vicar here. In fact, he was vicar of Bewley for 53 years. And he used to be in very close communion with the monks. He used to know them by their Christian name and shut up the church and have special services for them. What a very enlightened man he sounded. Yeah. Oh, may I join the choir invisible of those immortal souls who live again in minds made better by their presence. George Eliot. Oh, okay. uh, Silas Barner, I think. Yes. Of course, there was another man here who lives at Bewley who's seen the ghost of a monk. He's yes. Colonel Robert Gore Brown, who owns the vineyard here. Okay. The vines were actually planted on the same site as the monks had their vineyard 750 years ago, and we're now making wine again. Is that so? I must see him. Well, I have seen the ghost here. It's our old friend the monk, with the brown frock, down to his feet. I was taking my little dog in the afternoon for a walk up this road here. And over the brow of the hill, I saw the monk. And there was a, uh, a figure uh, clothed in a brown uh, jersey uh, down to its knees. Yes. And when I came to the top of the hill, nothing. Well, you'd obviously seen the monk in brown. I think I had. Mm. See what I mean? Yes. Now I want to take you to a part of the estate which I think is really the most haunted of the lot. This cottage is situated on what was the northeast corner of the abbey. We believe that its garden was where the monks were buried. Mr. Michael Sedgwick, who lived here for many years, can tell you about some of his strange experiences. My mother and I were sitting in this very room, and one night we heard most heavy, painful sounds of men carrying a burden down the garden. We looked out of the window, there was nothing whatever to see. Then the sounds became closer and more distinct, and there was definitely a suggestion of people digging. Heavy thumps and thuds. And I'm pretty certain the monks must have been reenacting a burial. And the chanting, did you hear the chanting? Oh yes, indeed I did. It was way back in December 1959, just before Christmas. I'd been working very late on a manuscript, and about midnight, I threw the windows open to try and get rid of some of the smoke in the room. And I heard what was quite definitely chanting. It was coming in uneven waves off the hill opposite the house, rather as if I'd been listening to a radio that was badly tuned in. Well, it didn't seem quite credible, so I switched my own radio on and fiddled around with it for ages, trying to find some station that was putting out a Latin service. Yeah. I found nothing. 
But I heard afterwards that someone in the village had just died and was to be buried the next day. Well, the monks were faithful to their accustomed ministry. That they were. Next day, I ran into Mrs. Day, and she told me she'd been out that very night, and had heard the same chanting out in the road. You should have a word with her. I remember walking home late one evening. It was very late. I just locked up the domus. We'd had a late dance. And I heard chanting in the distance. Mm. And it gradually seemed to get a little louder. It was more like a sort of murmuring, which seemed to come from the bottom part of this lane here, oddly enough, where we are now, and as if it was coming from the abbey there. Oh, yeah. It was a wonderful feeling of peace. It seemed to take away all my tiredness after a long day. How I wish I could hear it. I wonder if I should have the ears to hear. You may, you may not. Maybe tonight. You'll have to wait till around midnight. Never mind. We will keep tryst. much discussion with the witnesses, we decided upon a vantage point in the center of the cloisters, which more than once had reverberated with the sound of ghostly chanting. As we sat there silently, waiting for the hour to strike, our minds were as one, alert, expectant, hopeful, yet leavened by thoughts traversing centuries, back to the time when men worked and worshipped on this very ground. They say the voices of the monks of Bury Abbey are still raised in glorious song that time cannot silence. As I sat there thinking of these things, these immortal words of Lord Byron echoed in my mind. I merely mean to say what Johnson said, that in the course of some 6,000 years, all nations have believed that from the dead a visitant at intervals appears. And what is strangest upon this strange head is that whatever bar the reason rears against this belief, there's something stronger still in its behalf. Let those deny who will. I, for one, choose to believe it.